Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm pleased to have with me once again Kevin Duffy of Bearing Asset Management. Kevin entered the investing business in 1985 as an analyst and also as a strategist. He co-founded a money management firm in 1988 and after the 87 crash and cut his short-selling teeth during the late 1990s tech bubble. After the tech bubble burst, he co-founded Bearing Asset Management in 2002. Bearing warned about the housing and credit bubble of 2005-2007, shorting stocks such as New Century Financial, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, MBIA, Countrywide Financial, Wachovia, and Citicorp. Citigroup. Kevin wrote extensively on the subject, including articles, Alan, We Have a Problem, Mr. Mozilla Goes to Washington, and Honey, I Shrank the Net Worth. The firm's two long, short hedge funds profited from the unwind, including Bearing Fund, the more aggressive of the two, which gained over 100% in 2008, when most 401ks were turned into 201k accounts. So we're really pleased to have Kevin with us again uh, to observe the current market environment and uh, how we might prepare ourselves for the difficulties that uh, may very well lie ahead. Thanks for joining me again today, Kevin. Jay, good to be with you. It's always good to have you here uh, with me and to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, as an Austrian economist, as an observer of free markets, we're in a Credit boom. I think you've called this the everything bubble. Talk to us a little, a little bit about the current bubble that we're in and compare it with some of the more recent ones that we've had. Well, Jay, unfortunately, we've had far too much experience with, with bubbles over the last 20 years. And I think they all change their spots, which is why uh, they're not obvious uh, every time. And so uh, we've had the tech bubble in the late 1990s. We had the housing and credit bubble in, uh, in the mid 2000s thousands and and this bubble and and each one has been uh, basically seeded by artificially low interest rates um, this one is is a bit different because the uh, the suppression of interest rates went lower went down to essentially zero um, and it was for a long period of time for about seven years whereas the other ones were a couple of years two or three years during the uh, the, uh, the housing bubble and I think what what happens is the um, um, the public eventually comes into these bubbles at the very end. That's another uh, sign. There are many signs that we can kind of go over. But the first two bubbles were relatively narrow. They were more sector specific. So you had the tech bubble, um, and then you had the the housing bubble, housing and, and credit, basically Wall Street and the mortgage market. And and yet with those first two bubbles, there were places to hide at the top. So um, in the the tech bubble, especially, it was very narrow. The speculation was really focused on the dot coms and the technology stocks, but the old economy stocks were um, were really abandoned. In the run up, in the final parabolic run up to that bubble, they were abandoned. So you could have bought Procter and Gamble, and you could have bought some some of these old economy stocks really on the cheap. Um, the the credit bubble was a little bit broader, but there were still places to hide. You still could have bought bonds and done well. The everything bubble is very different because it's essentially a bubble in everything. We, we have a bubble in uh, commercial real estate. We have a bubble in bonds. We have a bubble, obviously, in stocks. So there just are, are much fewer places to hide, and it's been going on for much longer. The valuations are, across the board, um, higher. So you, you look at something like the median price-to-sales ratio, much higher than the 2000 bubble. So um, it makes this a, uh, a much more dangerous bubble. To, to navigate. There are just fewer places to hide. Fewer places to hide. Are there any places to hide? Absolutely. I think there are some places. The One of the things that's happened is we've had this, uh, it's been led, one of the main drivers, I think I think this, this boom, this bubble has had three key drivers. China, China at the margin got into this uh, early in 2009 in a big way. Um, it's been the bond market, the suppression of interest rates rates for seven years, and we've had a, a, a massive bubble in bonds peaked about 18 months ago when you had $14 trillion in uh, government and corporate debt that was at negative yields. 
and and Fang, and the, the the big tech boom. The fact that you've had since 2000, you've had prices and bandwidth go down 99 percent, and that's unleashed a, a boom. It's really been a a second wave. So if you look at these technology waves, the the dot com bubble was a classic first wave where the uh, the pioneers take the arrows in the back, and you had 1,600 um, online pet suppliers, for example. There's no way that this could be supported. Um, um, and so a lot of these these companies went to, to zero. Um, the this wave, and I think this is one reason why that the bull market has, has lasted this long and has gone as far as it could, is that you've had this. Uh, it's a powerful second wave where you, you look at um, somebody like Jeff Bezos and, and Amazon.com. You had all these online companies, online retailers back in 2000, and then they got weeded out. And so this really played into the hands of the survivors. Uh, uh, and this is where some of the, the big fortunes have, have been made. So the first thing that's happened is we've had this kind of tech 2.0. You know, you had tech 1.0 in, in 2000, tech 2.0. And this has been, it's been more real, more sustainable. It's It's gone much greater. But as a derivative of that, we've had the, uh, the passive investing bubble. So, um, for example, uh, oh, all, of the, all the inflows have been massive inflows in, into um, each. ETFs and and also passive investing in mutual funds has gone into Vanguard and BlackRock. And so there has been this kind of uh, an passive divide where on the on the long side looking for opportunity there's been so much money that's funneled into into the Apples and the Microsofts and and the Amazons and a lot of stocks that don't fit into these index funds into these passive strategies have been kind of neglected. So yes, I think that's the I know I'm giving you a long long-winded explanation here, but in terms of where to look, you have to look over the index divide. The other area is uh, is gold. I think uh, gold and, and gold mining stocks are another place that you can hide out right now. They've been a- abandoned. You're known and have done very well you know, with your shorting strategies in the past. If those three areas that have caused the bubble, the everything bubble, China, the bond markets, and the fangs, are those some of the areas then you might be looking to short in one way or another now? Yes. Well, we've largely avoided shorting fang, thank God. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're trying to look at what's right in front of us. And, and so, you know, our belief is that we had these, the bond market moves in really long cycles. We had a uh, 35-year bull market in bonds, um, and it ended 18 months ago. Before that, there was a 35-year bear market in bonds. So I'm not going to predict how long the next bear market in bonds is going to be, but at this point, it's 18 months, and nobody's paying attention to this. Um, we don't think the, bond, the bear market in bonds ends at 18 months. We think it goes on for years, and it may go on for decades. So that's the first thing that we're, we're doing is we're looking at shorting bonds and uh, you know, I'll give you an example um, German boons, the 10 year uh, uh, German boon is yielding 63 basis points started the year at 43 basis points, um, it started uh, 18 months ago at the bottom it was a negative yield of about 13 basis points um, the, the real yield 18 months ago was minus 50 basis points right now the real yield has has actually expanded on the downside to minus 100 basis points. So you're getting so the so the German Bund is yielding 0.63 percent, and the CPI, the the 12 month year over year inflation rate is 1.65 percent. So we're shorting German government bonds. We're shorting Italian. We're shorting um, you know you can short the Japanese government bond uh, 10 year at seven basis points, and they and the country has their uh, the debt to GDP is about 250 percent. It's the highest in the world. So I think that's first and foremost, that's the area that we're shorting. That's working. Um, I think another area that's related to that would be commercial real estate and especially the retail REITs and the office REITs. Um, and these have actually started to, to work out very well. They're kind of bond surrogates and they've been moving, moving lower. And, you know, this is also a function of the last bubble that the fact that, um, we had retail square footage growth in the, um, from 2000 to 2007. It was about 8%. And since then, it has, has pretty much dried dried up, but there's still this overhang from the last bubble. And I think what's happened this time, we had a huge boom in REITs. 
And this was caused by the reach for yield. So the suppression of interest rates drove money into this area, and I think it's, it's very ripe. So, for example, since the, um, since the election, there's been hardly any movement up in net-net in, uh, in the REIT sector. And, uh, and now, especially the office and the retail REITs, there, there are all kinds of different REITs out there. But th- those are some areas that we're, we're, uh, we're focused on. Sure. Uh, what about junk bonds in general? We're short junk bonds as, as well. Um, we, we see the, uh, uh, the yield spreads are at record lows, um, and the, uh, the yields on uh, European junk, and we're not short it, um, but we probably should be, and the yields on, on European junk are actually lower than U.S. Treasuries. I mean, it's just we're, we're in silly season right now. Kevin, do you, you, you mentioned gold. What about gold shares? Yes, we like gold shares. I mean, on the negative side, as you know, Jay, it's a very difficult business. And if you give a, a gold miner money, you know, he'll, he'll drill holes with it. But we're in an environment right now of actually very loose money for uh, if you want to go buy a car. I mean, it's, it's, you, the, the financing is, is very, uh, very loose, very easy credit available. But if you want to start a gold mine, it's, uh, it's very tight. Um, so that's a good sign. That's definitely a good sign. Um, but uh, also just commodities in general. We, we feel that um, the economy right now is, you know, quote, booming, uh, whatever that means. But um, we don't see that continuing. And, uh, and we just feel that the price of their output price of gold will hold up, should do very well. And the, you know, the input costs are probably relative to gold um, in the next few years should be going down. So, um, and they're very cheap. I mean, as you know, Jay, the gold mining stocks are very cheap. Yeah, in fact, uh, if I compare the gold itself to the monetary base, gold is also very undervalued if you use that metric. But uh, you know, the market will determine what you know what what the price is ultimately. Uh, silly season, you say we're in right now. That certainly seems to be a great description of what's going on. Um, yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah go ahead. And Jay. You know, also um, to to add to that and and to fit another piece in with uh, with gold. You know, gold has had a couple of decent years, actually. Uh, very quietly, has had a couple of good years. Um, there were huge outflows from 2012, uh, 2012, 2013, 14 from gold ETFs. Uh, but they're very quietly, they've done, done, you know, they've had positive re- returns over the last couple of years. And, uh, but last year, it was the cryptocurrencies that got all of the, uh, the attention. And um, so I think, you know, talk about silly season, the, um, the bubble that we're seeing in cryptocurrencies and blockchain, anytime a company adds blockchain to their name or changes their name or uh, has a press release with blockchain in it, the stock doubles or triples. Now, these are the kinds of things, the kinds of wild speculation you see at the end of, of bubbles. Um, TD Ameritrade was another example. They reported earnings uh, last Monday, and uh, they report the uh, 35-year and younger clients, new clients, were up 72%, and trading activity for the year so far, just for the first two and a half weeks, was up 34%. And they said 6 to 9% of the trading activity is now in cannabis stocks and in blockchain stocks. So there's, you know, this is how crazy things have gotten. And if, you know, think about it, let's, let's fast forward. Um, typically, and this is another comparison that you can make to the past bubbles, is that the first areas that tend to uh, crack and give you a warning are the most marginal areas. So the, with the dot, you had the dot-com bubble burst, okay? And then, and it took, there was a, a certain uh, lag, but eventually the rest of the market went. And then you had, with the housing bubble and housing and credit bubble, you had the subprime lenders. Those are the mer- most marginal. They cracked in February, March of 2007, and then the, you had the meltdown in 2008. So I would not be surprised if it was Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has peaked at, uh, what, nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, and now we're at, at uh, you know, ten or $11,000. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency bubble were to burst. Well, we have six. 1,400 different cryptocurrencies right now. I mean, this is very reminiscent of the dot-com bubble where you had 1,600 online pet suppliers. 
So, um, you know, maybe what happens is that bubble bursts first, and that's a and and I can. I can see it right now. All the commentators will say, you know what, this is healthy. This is a healthy correction. We got rid of the speculative excess and nobody's going to connect the dots. That's another thing that you can look at. This is exactly what happened. They'll say, oh, this is isolated. This is contained. They, they'll, they'll dismiss any uh, dot connecting that, uh, oh, there's a broader cancer here. So that could also be something that gives gold a boost that it's just not going to have competition from the cryptocurrencies, not at least not as much. Yeah, I mean, uh, the um, the cryptocurrencies, uh, I mean, we have a 32-year-old son who's doing some investing now, and I sort of joked with him the other day. I said, you know, Scotty, we don't have to worry ever about a declining market anymore, do we? Uh, it just goes up every day, the S&P 500, and so we don't really have to worry, do we, do we, Scotty? And, um, well, I, I would ask you, uh, I would ask you, Kevin, what is to keep the Federal Reserve from pumping even more money in if the equity market starts to go down. It certainly has seemed to be very sensitive, as David Stockman calls it, whenever the stock market throws a hissy fit, the Fed comes to its rescue and pumps all that money in. There's all of the congressmen, the lawmakers in Washington seem to be more concerned about the stock market than they are about their about their voters, uh, at least about the welfare of their voters. So what um, what is to keep the Fed from this constant pumping that would keep things from falling off the cliff? Yeah, um, the this is a, a common perception, and I think it's a bit of a, a misconception. You know, first of all, what happens, what starts the bubble, what starts the boom going is the central banks putting their thumb on interest rates, the artificial suppression of interest rates. That's, that's what gets everything started. And, and it's a process. I mean, it doesn't just... You had, you know, relatively high saving rates. You had, there were people that were traumatized by the meltdown of, of 2008. And so behavior takes a while to change. You had um, the, for example, the stock buybacks. The stock buybacks at the, the best time to be buying stock would have been obviously 2008, 2000, you know, the end of 2008, 2009, 2010. Well, if you look at companies, especially in the retail sector, they dried up. The stock buybacks absolutely dried up during that time. The other thing that happened during that time was uh, that saving rates, uh, personal, this personal saving rate was high. Uh, so, so this behavior, it took a while. It took QE2. It took QE3. It took all this conditioning to kind of change everything. So um, get, get, getting back to your question, the Fed pumping, um, the Fed can, and the, and the central banks, they can artificially lower interest rate, but they don't control economic law. They can, they can suppress it initially. And what happens, and this is classic, you know, Austrian business cycle theory, is that when you lower interest rates, um, first of all, you're, if you had a, a normal lowering of interest rates, it would take a, an increase in saving. It would take an increase in capital. Okay. That's not what's happening here. You have an artificial lowering of interest rates. So, you're not setting uh, you're not setting aside more capital, okay? And in fact, in lowering interest rates, what you're doing is you are um, encouraging pe- or you're discouraging people from saving. So you are you're you're actually consuming capital. The other thing is you are encouraging people to consume. So capital is being consumed. Um, at basically at both ends of the Hayekian triangle, um, where where you have um, the uh, more roundabout processes. Uh, so at the earlier stages of production, so say R and D, research and development, the early stage commodities, that sort of thing, they're all at the early early stages, and they get they get pumped up. Well, um, you and you see that you see that with the fangs in, in uh, to start the cycle, they were spending five billion on R and D. You know now they're spending fifty seven billion. Um, so you have you have the the um, the consuming of of resources during this process, and it can't continue because you have what's happened is companies have businesses have taken on uh, more roundabout longer longer term projects, and the capital is not there to complete the projects. Um, so it's all misdirected, and then as this goes on longer and longer, and people, what do you see right now? 
saving rates are now, the personal saving rate is at 2.93%. It's at its very low levels. And um, so the resources are not there. And so what's happening is interest rates are starting to go back up as a reflection of supply and demand. The resources are not there. The capital is not there. And so I think you can, what happens is in the initial stages, yes, the Fed or the central banks can artificially lower interest rates, but then the market realities start to set in. And that's the stage that we're in, I think, Jay, is where rates are going up. And they're not going up because, because the Fed and the central banks are decided one day, hey, let's, let's drive up interest rates. No, they're reacting. They're being forced by market conditions. Thank you, Kevin. I think that is exactly right, and that's what I've believed, that it's not really the Fed. They would have us believe that the Fed is in control, that everything is done for our good, of course, by the Fed in their omniscience, and they would increase rates now because they know that it's the right time to do it. No, they don't know anything. It's the market that is taking us up, and that I think you explained it very, very well, what I think is really going on. On at this point in the credit cycle as well. And as Alistair McLeod has talked about on this show recently, we come at this point in the credit cycle also when rates start to rise that banks have to sell their treasuries or else they'll take losses on those treasuries and they start making loans and pumping money into the economy and that sort of stimulates things too for a little while. So it's really, really interesting. So we're just about out of time here, but are you concerned at all about, I mean, which way might this thing tip? We could see, I mean, if we get a kind of really devastating stock market decline with rising interest rates, which seems very logical. We could also go back into the same kind of a situation we had in 2008, 2009, only possibly worse because the bubble is so much larger. Uh, yes, I think that uh, well, Ray Dalio, when he was in, in Davos, said uh, we are in this Goldilocks period right now where we have had this beautiful deleveraging. Um, inflation isn't a problem. Growth is good. Everything is pretty good with a big jolt of stimulation coming from changes in tax laws. Um, this beautiful deleveraging. Well, we haven't had a beautiful deleveraging. The, um, the public debt as, as a percentage of GDP this cycle has gone from 35% to 75%. Um, we have margin debt at $580 billion, 3% of GDP, which is about as high as it gets. Um, we have all kinds. We, there's no cash on the sidelines. Um, so this is we're at a very precarious point, and I think the most important thing is to, to understand that rising rates are kryptonite to bubbles. It, they've every single time. It's just a question of when. It's a question of how high rates have to go. And if you look at the two-year Treasury, so risk risk off. Um, it, it, let's take that as a proxy. Two-year Treasury is at 2.12 percent. Um, bond yield, I'm sorry, the S&P 500 yield is about 1.8, 1.9%. So we've now crossed over where there is an alternative. This isn't Tina, there is no alternative. There is now an alternative to stocks to risk on. And, um, and this is the first time that there has been an alternative since September of 2008. So we're in a very different environment right now. I think rising rates are kryptonite to bubbles. It's just a matter of when. And I think everybody thinks that they have a window where the, the yield curve has got to invert or we've got to go to, you know, X percent on interest rates, three, four, or five percent before it, it kills the party. And I think everybody thinks that they're, uh, they're going to be able to hand over the bag to somebody else and they're sort of playing this greater fool game. But um, uh, I, I really think that rising rates will, will continue and that will – you'll see these bubbles start to burst maybe with Bitcoin initially in the cryptocurrencies and then it will start to spread. But, uh, but just keep an eye on, on rising rates. All right. Well, we'll have to leave a go at that. Uh, for those listening to the show, it's BearingAsset.com, Bearing, B-E-A-R-I-N-G, Asset.com. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us today and um, for your insights into the markets. I think they're spot on, so I want to – Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Jay. I really enjoyed it. 